Welcome back to the lab. Today we need to design another custom magnetic component. This time we need a transformer capable of establishing 5 kV isolation while passing 2400 watts of power through it. We want to use a full H topology. We've been setting the stage of this video for a long time. We discussed high voltage PCV design, creep pigeon clearance, we discussed transformer design when we made the push-pull transformer for the old UPS. Wow, we've actually talked a lot about custom magnetics. We discussed saturation and the saturation mechanism and ferric core materials while designing that custom inductor. We're going to be applying these concepts to design a few key transformers for the converters. A 2400 watt full H isolation transformer for the PFC, a 10 watt flyback transformer that we'll use many times, and a 2400 watt high turns ratio full H isolation transformer for the DC to DC converter module. And more! Today we're discussing the 2400 watt isolation transformer that will be the second stage for PFC. It has a 1 to 1 turns ratio and like we said, pushes a lot of power through it. The design inputs for the PFC are dictated by the architecture and we'll talk through that in a few days but I already have that so I know a little bit more than you right now and that's okay. Here's what we need to know. The AC to DC PFC now lives in its own isolation region and generates 450 volts DC. At least that's the goal. This is then converted down to 350 volts by what we expect to be a standard full H converter. So we're doing a step down so a one to one transformer is okay. It's critical that this transformer establishes no less than three and a half kV of isolation between the mains and the 350 volt DC bus. But as long as we're making five kV isolated transformers, we'll probably just design this one the same way. Ripple considering, I wanna make sure that we can maintain a reasonable level of regulation on the output of this PFC module. And what I mean by a reasonable level of regulation is a small enough voltage ripple that we'll always be operating in the step down mode. Our PFC will never drop below 350 volts. And this allows us to design that full H converter with a one to one transformer. So that'll become a design constraint of the PFC. The RMS input current is 5.3 amps and the RMS output current is 6.7. We're targeting a 100 kilohertz switching frequency and a ripple current of no more than 1.1 amps. This ripple current is assumed at a duty cycle of 90% and that is our maximum designed duty cycle. 2400 watts of power will be flowing on both sides of this transformer. After firing up our magnetics design tool, we found, first of all, that the core we selected manually a while back was high in our list of results, so win. Good job. The N87 55mm by 28 by 21mm standard E-core. Just for fun, uh, let's consider this as a solution because, hey, it works last time, it might work this time. After a brief price check, we found that it was $4 per E-Core half. Two of those halves are required to make one transformer, so it'll cost around $8 for the core material. However, with a bit of tuning, there is another option with slightly higher losses, but a smaller size. A 49mm by 25mm by 16mm N87 material ETD core only costs $2.46. The shape is slightly different. That's what the T is. It's slightly toroidal. The center leg is round instead of square, but I think that's fine. In fact, it might be better. This solution would bring the cost of the ferro material down to around five bucks per transformer. That is a 37% cost reduction. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a win to me. So this transformer design calls for 33 turns of 20 gauge wire with three strands in parallel. That leaves us sitting at a cool seven watts of power dissipation, a magnetizing inductance of five millihenries and an expected operating temperature of 70 C when operating at room temperature. I like it. After adding the coil former and clips to the cart, the cost of one set of parts, like one set of magnetic components, excluding the wire comes out to $9.17 per transformer. Using the average diameter of the coil former, 27.5 millimeters, I then solve for the total quantity of wire required to build this transformer. Take the circumference of that diameter since this is a circular winding, multiply that by three parallel strands, multiply by 33 turns, and the end result is 8.6 meters of wire per winding. That is a lot, and there's two windings. So this means that each transformer will have 17 meters of 20 gauge wire wrapped around it. Wow. 20 gauge enameled copper wire at quantities I'd like to buy runs about 20 cents per meter. 17.2 meters of wire translates into three and a half dollars worth of copper on the transformer. Total cost, $12.7 plus labor time. Not bad. So now comes the fun part. How in the world are we going to establish 5,000 volts of isolation from primary to secondary? It may seem scary, but the principles are fundamentally 
no different than before when we were talking about a plane on a PCB. If we think about creepage simply as the distance along an insulating surface from one conductor to another, as well as the clearance from one conductor to another being clearance, then the result is simple. We should maintain a gap between the edges of the bobbin and where the windings stop. This space will be used to establish what is called margin tape, where the tape extends out beyond the winding so that electrons need to creep around it and back to get to the next row down. And that tape is there to establish creepage distance. Kapton or polyamide tape has an incredible dielectric strength. Even a small single layer of this stuff that's 25 microns thick can withstand around 5 kilovolts. However, electrons don't mind creeping around the edges of that tape or any material, so what I'll do is I'll use my widest tape, which is 50 millimeters. We'll use this tape and overlap each layer so the total thickness is two tape thicknesses, where 50% of the tape is overlapping. This provides twice as much electric strength vertically through the tape, but it also provides 25 millimeters of creepage, where the electrons would be creeping between the two layers of tape along the adhesive. I'll strive to pull a similar trick on the ends of each row of windings, and I'll try to wrap the 50 millimeter tape around the last few windings to establish creepage without sacrificing precious window area for margin tape. That's probably not going to work though, because folding the tape at 90 degrees to get the windings in there, while it's bent in a circle around the core of that transformer, is going to be pretty much impossible. If instead we leave 5 millimeters of margin tape on either side of the bobbin, that should provide sufficient creepage distance. When we get the parts back and we're ready to test, I'll measure the inductance from both windings and verify that they are sufficiently isolated from one another. Before we commit to this transformer, I think that it would be best to throw together a quick simulation that demonstrates how this transformer works to make sure that it's on a path for success. If we're driving this transformer with ideal waveforms and there's massive voltage transients, ringing, or other nastiest, I want to know now so we can modify our transformer design and have something that's ready to work in our system. I pulled in the most critical parameters, those being magnetizing inductance and the ESR of our windings. I also estimated our leak in inductance to be approximately 5 microhenries, which would be pretty great if you ask me. That would be 0.1% of our magnetizing inductance, which seems incredibly small. With an ideal waveform coming into this transformer, so 450 volts bipolar, correct duty cycling, and a resistive load, when we're getting 2.4 kilowatts out, I measured 2.6 kilowatts from the pulse generator and 2.44 watts reaching the resistive load. That is not bad, not bad at all in fact, an efficiency of 93%. It leaves a little bit to be desired, but honestly that should be acceptable. A big shocker for me is how much ringing we're seeing with a 450 volt input that's clamped and a snubber on both sides of the transformer to ground. I'm still seeing around 40 watts dissipated in each snubber, so that's 80 watts lost in each. That's a total of 80 watts lost in transient suppression. For context, the diodes that we just pulled out of LT Spice randomly to rectify the output are only dissipating 20 watts. Like they weren't even picked as an optimal solution. They were just the closest thing I found in three seconds in LT Spice. So our optimized snubbers are dissipating as much power as four random rectifier diodes that we're using to rectify a PFC. That makes no sense. If I had to hazard a guess, which I do, I'd say that the reason that we're seeing such a large voltage transient is relatively simple. I think that we're being bitten by a characteristic of real diodes called recovery time. In fact, these fast recovery time diodes that we selected for the rectifier would ideally immediately turn on. They would immediately dump energy from the output filter of the converter they would immediately dump energy from the transformer to the output filter of the power converter immediately. Like There would be no delay. They would just go from off to on right away. However, they need some time to change from non-conducting to conducting, and that time is when the voltage goes all destructive. So what's our solution? Silicon carbide. By substituting our standard silicon diode for silicon carbide, there are no options with much faster reverse recovery time. This means that our diodes will go from off to on faster. This in turn reduces the energy that needs to get absorbed by the snubber while it waits for the diode to conduct. After some soul searching, we settled on a 650 volt diode from on semiconductor, which gives 200 volts of margin to account for that ringing. One would think that should be plenty, but fighting with snubbers is turning out to be a common and difficult battle. After some iteration and optimization, we found a configuration that seems to work properly, even if we add a wide tolerance to the leakage inductance even if there's only 30 volts of margin. <laughs> oh, that's a little close for comfort. 
But if the PFC can maintain a maximum output voltage of 425 volts instead of 450, and we can keep the leakage inductance of our transformer to less than 0.5%, then I think we can say that we found a solution. I'm planning to place a snubber across each diode plus a snubber across the transformer itself. This was done so that there's a dedicated snubber to place very near each diode being protected, and the snubber for the transformer is placed as close to the windings as possible. These are key points of the circuit. Limit the peak voltage right at the place where it's generated. Don't even give it an opportunity to couple through the board. Just crush it right at the source. Then what does get through that first stage of filtering, that transient needs to get through the trace impedance. We're using the parasitics of the board to our advantage. And then the four snubbers across each diode help to limit that peak voltage specifically at the place where it will cause damage. I've plotted the power dissipation in the new snubbers as light blue and the power dissipated as the diodes as bright green. If I hold control and click on the name of each trace, we can see the RMS power burned in the snubbers is 9 watts. This is spread out between all five snubbers because I added it all together, and the maximum power dissipated by any one resistor is no more than 1.8 watts. Doing the same for all of the silicon carbide diodes shows the total power dissipation of around 15 watts. All things considered, not so bad. So far we've got about 10 watts lost in the transformer, 15 watts in the rectifiers, and 9 watts lost in the snubbers. And that's when we're outputting 2400 watts. So that means that our maximum efficiency is 98%. That is a lot better. That's awesome, because that means we still have some margin for our switching FETs. It'd be nice to stay above 90% efficiency for the whole PFC, and I think that'll be a challenge, but it doesn't sound impossible. 90% total efficiency for the PFC module will require both the PFC and the full H to be operating at or above 95% efficiency. That's a tall order, but we might just be able to pull this off. I don't have quite enough time to design the custom output inductor for the full H, but we can at least throw some numbers around as long as we've got the simulation here to look at what seems like a reasonable value or an optimal value. When I tried 400 microhenries as the output inductor, that limited the peak-to-peak -peak current ripple on the output to around 1.4 amps. That felt like a pretty good balance point between what should be a, an inductor size and ripple current, so I'll target 400 microhenries while designing that inductor. This is going to be another custom inductor because it needs to be another inductor that can withstand 450 volts. A film capacitor is what we plan to use as the second half of this filter, and we're using one, well we plan to use one that's optimized for use in high voltage DC links, like we're doing now, and it's a 7 microfarad capacitor that can handle 7 amps of ripple current. Wow. With a 7 microfarad output capacitor, our output voltage ripple is only 240 millivolts, which I think is perfectly reasonable. Well, we got a lot done today. We designed a transformer, we selected some components for the snubber, and we defined a maximum leakage inductance for the transformer. There is still some work to do. The output inductor needs to get designed. We need to think about if our winding strategy is on course to achieve less than 0.5% leakage inductance, but I think we'll get where we need to go. If you like what you saw today, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos, where we will discuss some critical decisions that were made for the interface between the backplane and the power module. We'll also talk about the changes required to transform our preliminary PFC into a power module for the UPS. I think that this second stage of our PFC is looking great. If you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, finding us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching it, you for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!